welcome along once again to the Left Wing Back Podcast with me, Kevin Regan. We've had an unbelievable reaction to both of last week's episodes with Paul Kelly and Tarlock O'Brien. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for all the kind messages about the podcast so far. Today we are continuing our My Time in the Gansey series and we're off to St Mullins, where today's episode is brought to you in association with Oatwire PVC Glazing Limited, known as the man who does the windows, for all your replacing windows, doors and broken double glaze units. Our guest today holds the distinction of scoring the first ever sideline cut worth two points in hurling during the noughties. He's also one of the rare few St Mullins people that have played county football with Carlo, and he also famously got a lift back to Dublin after a county game with a bus full of pensioners on a day out. All those stories and more are coming in your direction with today's guest, Mr. Pat Cody. Pat, you're very welcome. Um, we have you here, of course, to share some of your fond memories. You have plenty of those um, for both your time with Carlo and St. Mullins. Oh, sure. Thanks, Kevin. Nice to be talking to you in this funny old times. And I suppose the first thing I'd say is I hope anyone who hears this is in good form and keeping well and that we'll pull all pull together and, and uh, we'll all be put, uh, on the hurling fields again fairly soon. But uh, yeah, I have. Um, Massive memory, sir. It is uh, it's a great part of my life. Uh, always has been from the time I could, I could walk. And my first memories were my father putting a hurl in my hand and uh, telling me to use both hands, pull left and right. And so I always, I was always one to try and and, and emphasize that. But um, yeah, that was a great, great time, great time hurling and uh, a, a huge amount of friends uh, all over the all over the county and all over the country even. Uh, as a result of it, I have to say, you know, great, great times. I know you were very close to your dad, who, who sadly passed away in the last couple of years. Um, is it fair to say that he perhaps might have been the biggest influence on you growing up in terms of getting you into hurling? Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. Out front of the house and and uh, uh, up to the, or just a road going across in front of the house, and uh, he would always. He'd always be at the bottom end of it because it was a, it was a, a horrible <laughs> hill that if the ball was missed, he'd go down after it. But I suppose then as the years got older, as the years got older, um, when I got older, I suppose, and Teddy was getting a small little bit, a bit slower, the, the roads were reversed. I was at the bottom of the hill. I was at the, the, the side of the road that had the hill at the bottom of it. So if I missed the ball, I was the one who had to go after it. But uh, yeah, we, that's where that's where the I suppose the hurling skills were honed, both off the gable end as well, uh, which unfortunately, unfortunately for me, poor mother, uh, had the kitchen window in it. And uh, thankfully, Daddy was a good man with his hands, so many of the time he had to, he had to replace the painted glass. Uh, and uh, uh, pick up showers at last from inside inside in the kitchen floor but uh, I'm not the only one I'd say around the country that has stories like that uh, from uh, a hurling childhood Absolutely well talking to a lot of sports people growing up when Wimbledon was on it was tennis um, when the other football final was on it was football hurling as well of course uh, but I just get the feeling and maybe I'm assuming this wrong given the fact that you are where you are neatly tucked in between Wexford and Kilkenny was it just pure hurling growing up? Uh, I suppose at at a, a representative level and a, yeah, it was it was really like I'd be a, a big sports fan and, and like there is, there is a there is a fence outside across the road from my house that uh, was it was used as a tennis a tennis net around the time Wimbledon all right and when we were in the primary school around January and February would be turn around playing rugby when it was six six nations time but no it was hurling hurling always was the one and uh, a smattering of football but really hurling hurling from the time we were able to able to walk and, and was a hurl putting our hands and and uh, down in the primary school in newtown down in st mullins and uh, we always hurled for, uh, at, at 11 o'clock break half 12 break and we had a two o'clock break that time so there were some epic matches played uh, uh, during those break times and our um, our teacher at the time uh, Vincent Corn who was from the Roar uh, often uh, left us out longer than we probably should have because the, the games were so so uh, epic and there were such such, competitive, such competition going on um, but um, yeah that's that's where a lot of the the, the, the graffer came and uh, I suppose at that time, um, when we were of an age, the first representative level that you would play at was under 12. Uh, and uh, so basically you wouldn't be probably playing for the club until maybe around 10. And um, like nowadays, they're starting off at under six level and they're, they're putting, on the, putting on the old jersey as soon as they go to school, like, you know, so... I suppose that's a bit that's a bit of a different a bit of a difference nowadays. Like they're they're in more a more structured type of hurling from 
I suppose, nearly the word go, uh, which maybe has its merits as well. But I suppose the, uh, we kind of, we learned our early type of hurling from out in front of the house and off a of gable end walls and, and from flaking each other at blow in the, in the playground in, in, in school. And I, I'd say kind of, so to us, I'd say to an extent um, as we got older, like, you know. So despite the fact that you've said that it's kind of hurling, 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 I do believe rightly or wrongly hearing a story anyway that you were with the County Under-21 footballers at some stage. Is that true or false? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was for a season there um, because, uh, well, I suppose I played a fair bit of football in, 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 at underage level. We, we got, we, you know, we, we played under 14 football with St. Mullins because we just had a group of players, a group of, of fellas of an age, you know what I mean? We, we, just, ha- we just happened to be lucky to have a fair number where I suppose St. Mullins at the moment and smaller rural clubs uh, fall down on numbers and would say, you know, to be competitive. But we had just a a group of fellas that were of an age coming through and we liked the old football and we played it at second level schools. We played a fair bit of football over in in, in, in the Tekken Burris. And uh, we were fairly competitive under 14 level. So there wasn't much more football played apart from schools football than for me anyway until I went to college in St. Patrick's and teacher training college in Drumcondra and I would have been playing a, a bit of football there um, would have won a Division 2 or Division 3 I can't remember a uh, third level league medal up there and would have always liked to have a go and just when you when you get to a certain level and you think you might have a certain a certain bit of ability at a game you'd like to see how far you can push it and uh, at the time then the county board in fairness in their wisdom were um, they ran a winter a winter under 20 or under 21 league f- to try and encompass players from like to say Mullins or some players that would be from hurling clubs that w- wouldn't necessarily have had a chance to get uh, to represent themselves at a under twenty under twenty one level. So what happened was that anyone that was interested uh, from St Mullins could um, play with Mullins to Rangers uh, uh, in that in that tournament. And uh, we I played on it. I think I was and Sean Gann, you probably know Sean. Uh, he was on it for a while and he went up training, but I was the only one that kind of stayed at it. And I was playing on that team, and and that was that that kind of league was that league was kind of put in place to kind of try and secretly unearth a few more players that might might possibly play on the other twenty one county team. And lo and behold, I got me a chance to win with them and, and train with the panel and, and uh, yeah it was it was a nice thing to be able to say that yeah we went we played uh, Westmead in the first round of the Leinster Championship and I was um, I was centre forward on it and uh, unfortunately Westmead were, were it was coming off the back of the team that won the uh, won the, the Leinster Championship and they won the All-Ireland that time I think didn't they at minor level so we happened to be my, my one and only time as an Inter county footballer we came up against a very strong team up up in uh, up in uh, I can't remember was it it wasn't Mullingar I don't know where the game might have been in, in uh, Castletown Gagan maybe it was uh, not sure but uh, the beat us I'd beat us very handily but I think I got a pint or two so I was happy enough with myself but um, yeah I I would have liked to have maybe had a go at senior level up the years. Maybe see could I give it a go? Maybe and win and train with them, and if it was good enough, fair enough. But uh, with 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 work and work and college and and uh, I suppose the more the hurling took over, then it was harder harder to be able to maybe get yourself up to what level you might be at. So that chance never really came. So from under twenty one level to just hurling, hurling, hurling from there on and the other old junior football match with St Mullins when we had a team at the time but uh, no, it was hurling from then on. Right. Um, underage county then. Um, obviously, you, you blossomed somewhat with St Mullins going through underage ranks and had relative success as well. Um, under 21 in particular, I do recall perhaps you playing Kilkenny, I think, and giving them a right go-go at the time. I know you speak fondly of that one. Yeah, we had. I yeah, That was one that kind of, I think that got away on us yeah, to an extent, I'd say. Uh, Kevin, we, we had a very, very good team um, that, again, was all fellas that were kind of up to the age and on all good strong hurlers like we'll say Davy Wall and Tony Meany from Ballinkillen and 
Um, Sean Spoon from Michel, Killian Griffith from Manchester Rangers, and his, actually his cousin Justin up from up from Tullo, Jamie O'Toole up from Tullo. Uh, you know, we had a very very strong team and loads of loads of strong strong hurlers, and uh, we played. We played uh, Kildare team in what was known then, I think it was the Leinster Special uh, Final in Bagnestown. And I, if I remember rightly, um, at the time that Kildare team were kind of being seen as kind of a, a little pet project of GA and as a fair bit of funding being uh, pumped into them and they were going to be a kind of maybe seen as a possible breakthrough team. And uh, they came down uh, to Bagnestown that night and they were, I think they were, they were fairly sure of maybe rolling us over and going on to the Leinster Championship proper and uh, like in a, in a super super game I always remember it was a great game um, we beat them and uh, I think I, I was captain of the team that time because we won the under 21 championship with St. Mullins the year previous and um, so we would have went on then and we were drawn against Kilkenny in the first round and again we had the game was in Bagnellstown and our, we had about we had about five weeks I'd say five or six weeks to prepare between the between the that Leinster special final and the first round against Kilkenny and uh, for various reasons that we that I you know I, I'm not really sure how, how it came about but we only got together about four or five times maybe once a week uh, in, the, in the in the intervening period between the two matches and I would have thought you know it was, I was kind of pushing for more training and more, more time together with, with the group because I really thought like that we had a chance against Kilkenny you know and um, as it turns out we played them at, it was a, a fine, lovely fine summer's evening in, in Bagnus time we played them and I think they beat us by about nine points and um, it would have been Ollie O'Connor of Freshford would have been their, one of their main forwards he was a strong minor up along and, and uh, uh, he, he scored I think, two or three goals and he was a difference between the two teams but I, I think that if we had had maybe a small bit better preparation that possibly we, we could have maybe turned to Kenny over that time and uh, yeah, I just look. I always think that was one one that got away from us. All right, yeah. Um, I remember actually, uh, my father used to work in Freshford in um, for years afterwards. I used to, I used to have work with him for the summer, and uh, I would have gotten to know and met Michael Cavan at the odd time up there in Freshford. And he always remembers being at that match. He was a younger fella. That he was young that time. You know, he was up there uh, probably supporting Ali O'Connor from St. Lockton's like, and uh, he remembers thinking that Jesus that they got away with murder that night because he didn't think it was well that Carlo maybe had, it had to be a little bit sharper a, bit, a little bit better prepared that we they could have could have beaten Kilkenny and, uh, and I remember him saying Jesus the embarrassment of that would have been something shocking he said but like that's just I suppose the Kilkenny, the Kilkenny attitude Other underage success kind of with Carlo or St. Mullins that sticks out before we kind of rack on to the, the senior setup. Yeah well like I was saying about the group of players that I grew up with um we won the first ever under 12 title that the, the club ever won in, in St. Mullins history. I think I was captain of that, time, that team as well. I was 11. Um, and we won a few under 14s. And, uh, and then that team in 1990 won the first ever minor championship in the history of the club. Like, and I suppose people, when I, like, I suppose the club, our St. Mullins club was at the at the head of the role of honour at senior level and, uh, and adult level but um, I suppose it's, it's a strange maybe strange thing and again it's down to probably the fact our numbers are small but the fact that we kind of maybe are lucky enough and that we, we hold on to our holders a bit, bit, with a bit more success than maybe than other clubs that, are, that have other sports to pull from but we, we won the first ever minor might have won 321 medals because at that time you could play from the age of 16 on the 21 team. Like there was no more, there was no age limit as regards how young you could be on a team. I think I possibly might have been on, on when I was 15, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's definitely 16 anyway. Uh, and we we won I think won either three or four 121 medals. Um, and actually the first adult medal I ever won was a junior medal in, in 1991. Um, which was a very, a very memorable team because we, it was, you know, it was a team of young and old. Um, like Jim Keelty was full back in that team and was mad match in the final against Michel, and he was marking Eamon Quirk of Michel. So like there was a, a back back generations like you know and, and uh, Jim Keelty would have been on teams that played with my father in the sixties. 
So, you know, the, it, it, that's the one great thing about junior hurling, I suppose. A lot of careers come to their natural end and, and careers start off, you know, at that level. And, and just it was great, great crack out here. I always remember very well um, that um, that summer again I was working with my father and because I was, suppose I was young, I was 16, I wouldn't have been the heftiest. I felt I was a bit of a slip of a chap. And uh, they were looking for me to play in this junior team anyway, and uh, my mother wouldn't wouldn't hear of it. She said, "Oh, sure, he's too young. He'll he'll, he'll get uh, he'll get broke up. You know, he'll get bursted and to be oh, lads pulling on him and all this, you know." So, sure, daddy, daddy never said a word anyway. But uh, this weekend anyway, Mam had gone to Dublin to visit her sister, and uh, we were due to the same ones were due to play Michael over in Boris in, in, in the Rangers pitch in, in I think it was the last round of the league section of the championship I said to my father um, at work I said we might go to a junior match tonight there daddy uh, I think I might be oh, have, I, I might be in the gear I said because they're still I think they're looking for a free taker which they were uh, James Cavanagh uh, uh, brother of Declan's was the, one of the selectors and he kept he was to be on to my father would you let the union come in we, we need a free taker you know so um daddy said, I should go anyway and see what, what happens anyway. Sure I sure threw the gear in the car and straight away I was playing the minute I went over. And uh, once I was playing, once I got playing, <laughs> my poor mother couldn't uh, couldn't say to take me off it, you know. But um so Michael Michael could beat us very well that night and uh, we played Balnebrana uh, in the semi final above in, in Carlow Town uh, above sorry, Dr. Colin Parr. And uh, we bet Bender Ben. I was on the freeze that night, and then we played the, the, that fight against Michael. And uh, we were we were severe underdogs, like we were. As well as one of the, the great characters in them, one of Joe Whitley said, we'll, we'll come in the back door, lads, long before there was ever a back door championship or final. But uh, no one gave us a hope. But um, I suppose it was the, the good to that minor team that won the championship the year before, 1990 was on the team and then with, sprinkled with a few older heads like Jim Keelty and uh, I think we won the final eight points to five against uh, against Michel and I remember coming out I was marking the great John O'Hara of Michel uh, who's sure one of the all-time greats of Carl Hurling like you know and I thought I was in for it I was going to get bet up and down the field but like I didn't know John I didn't and and uh, sure John was a real gentleman and uh, the, the cleanest hurler hurler to, to, to his fingertips like you know and I, I never laid a finger on me he hooked me and blocked me a few times alright but never laid a finger on me and it was a very enjoyable enjoyable start to me at a hurling career I have to say Good stuff so um, progressing on to senior in the county hurling then who was the, the man that gave you your debut? Uh, Mark Fitzpatrick was the man that gave me my debut Um and I suppose there's a great story there's a bit of a story behind that too um, I was in just started second year in in, in college in, in St. Pat's in Drumcondra and uh, that time the league was just a, a straight four four divisions of eight uh, where the the league was decided between uh, divisions one and two we'll say the, the top two teams I think were went to a semi-final or there was quite and then uh Second and third would have uh, in Division One would have played first and second in Division Two in quarterfinals and uh, something along those lines. Anyway, whereas then uh, in Division Three and Division Four, your whoever was top of the league was were the league champions, and that was that. There was no no playoffs or no finals um, at the time. So um, yeah, we were in Division Three, and it was 1993. So Carlo had just the previous year won the famous Ireland B over in London and had uh, the great game against Galway in uh, Dr. Holland or in Dr. Holland Park uh, that year and actually that was one of the years we, we, we were uh, we played after that game we played uh, under, uh, under 21 so we were a curtain raiser to that game we were played Bagelstown in an under 21 county final before that but um, yeah we went on then, and I was up in I was in college in Carlow I just turned 18 or sorry in college above in Dublin I uh, I was 18 years of age and at that time yeah sure I was training away I remember the, we had Marshall Michael had bet us again in the county final um, that year uh, and I think it was a, a drawn county final because I got I think I got the equaliser in the, in the, in the drawn game uh, and and uh, the Michael beat us in the final in the in the replay, but I remember 
coming out of the dressing room in 93 after that game and I was down in the dumps and whatever but like I don't know if I, at 18 years of age you're disappointed but I don't know if the, if the, if the um, there's always the next day when you're that young like you know you, you're disappointed but you're not that disappointed I don't know this, I suppose it's innocence of youth and, and that but Tommy O'Neill got me good to him the county secretary at the time handed me a little brown envelope and um I was trying to wonder what the envelope was and I was going out to the car and I opened it and there it was a letter uh, from invite me in to join the, a train with the county panel well it's, it's, I, I got into the car and I showed a letter to my mother and it's very same as except for winning the county final because you know uh, to me wearing the county jersey was always a very big thing and it, it, was, it was well sure apart from winning something with your county I always looked at it looked upon it as kind of the pinnacle because you, if you want to prove yourself and and show yourself to your best ability you know you can go great guns with your club but if you're lucky enough to be picked for the county and pitch yourself against people from other counties and other you know other hurling strongholds in the country that's that's the way you have to go you, you know you have to push yourself and see how good you can be and, um, so that was grand I remember the first training session we had I think there was seven at it and I was wearing an old white cotton t-shirt it was freezing cold it was hailstones and sleet falling and John Byrne and Michael was training and uh, one of the things that from Martin Fitz didn't know what to do there was only seven lads there so how, he couldn't have a training session but he started throwing up hurling balls between two people to you know to, to catch to, to, to toss it for in the air and he put me in with John Byrne and uh I tried to call a few off a, of a burn and, and he caught a few off of me and he gave me the other elbow but he was pushing me around because it was again it was very small you know and uh, would you believe him just I forget the message from John Byrne in Boston on my phone there <laughs> no that's that's gas you would that's that is that's gas now on, on, <laughs> yeah he said um ah oh, young Cody I couldn't catch him off you last time in the county final later and I was in Jesse caught enough of him off him because you know John was lethal you know but um uh, from that, I remember I was from that day on. I was I was I was got on very well with John. You know, John is a real gentleman and a great hurler. But trained away, and sure, it was that was that time the league was in October, starting October, November, like which is very soon after after um, after the All Ireland, after the All Ireland Championship, like you know. Um, and uh, I was up in Dublin, and uh, we were Carlo were down to play Mayo in the first round, and um, it was a home game. And that time, I would say St. Pat's College uh, have a team in the Dublin Championship. And they used to play in the Senior Championship when they had loads of loads of students. But at the time, there's only a small number. But we played in the, the Under-21 Dublin Hurling Championship. So we were drawn to play against uh, Nave Olaf. And uh, that was on the Saturday evening, the night before the game against Mayo. Now again, like, this is way before this is way before mobile phones and and you know social media and all that and training bands and you know the, the training wouldn't be as scientific and as 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 geared towards you know intercounty level as it is now you know so like there was no problem with me playing this match this 121 uh, Dublin Championship match uh, with the college and uh, so I think the match was around two or three o'clock on, on a Saturday afternoon we played we played the match and. They played won the match and were in right form after it anyway and um, one of my teammates uh, suffered a dislocated shoulder so we had to cart him into into the matter hospital anyway into A and E and, and see could he get sorted with his shoulder and um, as it turned out between the jigs and the reels I missed the last Kavanagh's bus to the JJ Kavanagh bus down home that night for the game so I was that was my way home for the game you know. So again, it just the, the I suppose the, the innocence of youth and all that, and I said, "Gosh, we're fake now." I never thought I was going to be playing. You see, I never, I never expected that I was going to be playing. No, I had a clue what the team was because I hadn't been uh, down from college that week at all. I had stuff on in college that I couldn't make training during the week. And again, there was no mobile phones. I had no the phone in my own house was out of order, so I literally had no contact with home. You know, so I. Eventually got back to fit to Drum Condra. Your man was still in his uh, uh, Aaron's the St. Pat's jersey, Tipperary jersey, Tipperary colours. And sure, what would we do? Only I wasn't going to be able to get down for the match, and that's terrible. Sure, I was only going to be a sub anyway in my own mind. So sure, we started had we had a few pints in Fagans in Drum Condra, and there was a, a public payphone there, and I 
so that it'd give me entering over, she lives over in Clontarf, and I picked up the phone and threw a few uh, 20 pence pieces, as they were at the time, into the phone, and, uh, and uh, made a few, made the phone call to me aunt and just said, Jesus, I wonder if there's any way to get the message home, I won't be home for the match, I'm missing the bus, and she says, but sure, she says, you may go home, you're playing, <laughs> you know, and I says, huh, she says, yeah, you're playing, you're starting, she said, you're, you're playing corner forward tomorrow, so then, the panic started. I was after having three or four points at this stage, and and, and uh, I came out to the boys and I said, "Jesus, lads, I'm 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 starting tomorrow. What am I going to do? You know." So eventually, uh, word got uh, me me aunt got word to our next door neighbours, and they came in and told me father. And um, at the time, um, he uh, drove a little kind of a, a, a little minibus because uh, he was I said he's working in Freshwater, but he was have good to you. I was working with him from around, and he was. The, the boss man gave him a van so he could transport the workers up so our minibus so um, word got back and I had, a, I had to wait in Fagans unfortunately for the phone to ring back and the word got back and I had that he was going to drive up the minibus in the morning uh, to click me and he said he'd be, he'd be up for me at around 9 o'clock so that was grand and I went back up to oh I went back down to the accommodation and I had me accommodation in Dublin and I said I better start reminding myself anyway, I was only after having three pints, <laughs> you know. So the boys and the boys said where they were in, in Fagans and eventually got home around two o'clock and she woke me up and whatever and it wouldn't have been the the more the most ideal preparation for for my inter county debut, but a, a match the day before and a few pints after it. But um so daddy arrived up on the next morning and, and uh the boys sort of said they'd have to come down with us. Uh, so they'd have to see me making my inter county debut, you know. But uh, we were driving down the Nace Road anyway, and by the time we got going, I suppose, and everyone got up and got their breakfast, we were coming along. Uh, it's around 11 o'clock, I suppose, or whatever. And um, we were coming by, you know, the black, the black church in there on the Nace Road, uh, yeah. coming out of Dublin, just after you come out of Red Cool there. Well, they, I was always noticed there, there was always a sign out, outside that pub for all day breakfast available. So, my father saw the sign anyway, and the boys were driving for a, a big fry up. So, in we had to pull into the, the Black Church Inn on the way down to this match, and I was breaking it like, you know, I says, Yes, Daddy, we won't be in time, have to be down in time for this match, you know. So, like, because it was winter time, it would, the match would have been on about two or half two to, for the daylight, like, you know. So, the boys went in and they entered before they ever ordered breakfast or having pints. And uh, even my father said, sure, yeah, sure, I'll have a pint too. And next thing he says, sure, you will have a pint, will you? <laughs> you know, it's just from the old, old school, like, you know. I said, yes, Eddie, I can't have a pint. I won't have a pint. I said, I had three pints last night. I won't have a pint. So I didn't. But the boys had three pints and I had to drag him out the door to get into the, into the minibus to head on down and... Uh, so we got down anyway, and, and by the time we got down, and by the time we got back up to Dublin that night, the legend was that I call in, had four pints in the pub before I, before I went, before I set foot on the field. You know, I should advise were embellishing the story the whole time, you know. But, um, yeah, I point out it every time. Oh, of Jesus, every time. And yeah, Jesus, to be talking to you. Hey, lads, you hear about this fella? He played Medicine for County debut, and he had four pints on his way to the match. <laughs> but, um, Ash went down and I was Ash was very nervous and again I was only eighteen I was very slight but I was playing corner forward and um, I was thrilled I was absolutely thrilled to be making my inter county debut like and I was playing with the likes of Brendan Hayden and Joe Hayden and Johnny Nevin and all these guys that had just won and Pat Murphy from St Mullins and John Mack and Richie in the goal and all these players that had just you know won the All Ireland B the year previously and uh, I remember I got two points in the game. Uh, one was a, point, a pass I, mean, I, I I am the world's worst for remembering matches but I remember that game because Christy Keeley gave me a, a ball out over, out over the sideline and I turned and just I suppose home home venue I suppose I was able to turn and, 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 and drive it over from, from the sideline but another ball my second point then that day was Des big, big Des of course won the ball uh, didn't, he didn't lose too many of them and Sure, he was a pure danger man, and sure, there was about four lads around him, anyway. and strong and all as he was, he couldn't get around for him. So I, I made a cross, I suppose, across about 30 yards out. I made a run across in an arc in front of him, and I had a roar at him, big days, days, days. And he gave me a grand hand pass, and sure, it was only 30 yards out, so I, I clipped it over the bar. But I would have always said to him, and I hurled with him from the start of my career until the very end with Carlo, and I would have always said to him, Jez, Des. 
I know the year is hardly with you from my very first match was the only time you ever gave me a pass. <laughs> I saw it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I never got a pass from you ever ever since. So, and only for that, only for those four male lads hanging over, you guys said I would probably would never go on that day either, like you know. So I've always been joking about that, like you know. But it, it was a, it was a good day, you know, a good day. I just a memory that you always have and to be able to share with your with your father and 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 good college buddies as well. It was it was a good day, and. Um, the meal actually the, the the story goes on because the meal after the game that time we were in Carpenters. That's where that time the buses the buses would pick you up there to go back up to Dublin. So Daddy went down home anyway and um so we were in, I was in right form. I said, I have you pints now, all right? And we were drinking pints away and the four the four of us were there, four college boys were drinking away and that time sure that those buses to Dublin you see jam packed. And every time a bus arrived, there's only room for one or two people on the bus. And we wanted to stay together and enjoy the crack and whatever, like, you know. So you bus after bus after bus came. And by the end of the evening, anyway, we realized that with no more buses to come, we kind of forgot ourselves, like, you know. So we were stranded in, in Carpenters. So we said, how in the name of James are we going to get home? Uh, or go up to Dublin, like, uh, and uh, so I asked her, we'll fight, we'll work out something. So then all of a sudden, a crowd came in of uh, pensioners, we'll call them. Uh, half, half of women came in and the, the laughs and the cracks and the, it was unreal, like, you know. So I was in the in the toilet at one stage and, uh, and a fella came in and I said, yes, there's right old crack out there. Society here, man, the, the old ones are right crack society, you know. And he was the bus driver. Uh, it was a crowd from a bingo in Finglas where after uh, bringing two buses down to Tramore for the day, for to play at the slots and have just a day out like you know and they were stopping on the way home and to get a, a bite to eat and a, and a drink and sure I started working on it and I said Jesus this is like there's four of us and we're stuck we have no way back to Dublin we're up in St. Pat's and Rumcondra he wouldn't give us a lift home which is so no sooner was said than was done and we were the four of us in, in the back of a bus singing songs with a, a, a crowd of pensioners uh, from, Fing from the bingo and Finglas and they dropped us they, they took a detour up along they dropped us to the very gate of the house uh, we were staying in on, on Richmond Road in, in uh, just down near Talca Park there in, in Drumhandra so yeah so it was a memorable, memorable day I have to say from from start from the day before a memorable occasion from start to finish I suppose and, and uh, yeah it was, it was uh, something I don't think that would happen nowadays Um yeah, in the modern game, I suppose. You know, it was, it was a great old time, great, great crack out here. That is a, a senior county debut weekend that <laughs> yeah. I've never heard like oh, it before. Sure yeah, you know, really and yeah. truly. I'd kind of have forgotten about it, you mentioned it to me, about your know, stories from your time and your Carlo debut. But yeah, it was, it was gas, like, you know. But uh, I think if we're a task any of the boys now that were there, I'd be after having seven points on the way down to the match. <laughs> you know, I think it's very good. I, know, but, uh, I, I don't know about the bingo, but you hit the jackpot with the lift home, any for sure. Ah. Was the, the few points kind of before the game the night before and uh, the fry up before a game as well was that kind of common occurrence at the time and um, how much of an influence was it like did it do you any harm really in the grand scheme of things well you see everything I suppose it's like when you compare uh, eras and hurling and compare pair, uh, compare players from different eras everything is of its time and everything is uh, has relevance to its time you know and you do learn like you do learn as you go along and things evolve and the game is obviously after evolving and preparation for, for the game has evolved and like if I heard tell of one of a, a fella that I was involved with her, uh, over a team having a drink before the game to be ructions like you know that's just the way it is like you know so I suppose uh, you'd be a bit hypocr hypocr hypocritical that way like but um, I'd say now if I thought I wasn't if I had thought I was playing the next day I probably wouldn't have even had the points that time both because I would have been too nervous uh, but um, Manny and I will say with the club um, and even before the Al County final early on in my time would have went in with uh, kind of, it was almost a kind of a ritual with myself and Declan Kavanagh and Richard Reelan uh, we would have went in to maybe Greg the Manor or down to well we wouldn't go to Glyn into the pubs in St. Mullins because uh, we'd be under we'd be seen or it would be too obvious but uh, we might go and have one or two pints night before just again to calm the, to calm the nerves you know uh, um, and like as regards diet and that like that was never that was really not, never a part of of the planning for our matches like um, um, 
any time we would have ever travelled with the county team um, up to up to nearly not too far away from the end of my time with the county uh, whichever hotel you would have, you would have um, been staying in you would have had a fry up next morning before you got in the bus and went on again to the match and to be honest with you I can't remember ever suffering as a result of a fry up in a game I don't know I suppose I'd, I'd be thinking to myself even I see it at club level the amount the amount that player sacrifice and social on a social level I'd be glad that I was have looking back that my time coincided with a time where you, you were you it was a bit more scope to let your hair down as the fella says and, and enjoy yourself uh, which was also I suppose thankfully out of the clear of social media uh, as well like you know so yeah there was a few things that might have went on that if they were going on nowadays would be would be I suppose Twitter fodder and <laughs> and you could be in trouble but sure look at we we all did those sort of things and, and had great times uh, great times out here yeah is it harsh kind of to suggest that perhaps the highlight of that particular time with Carlo was maybe those type of things that happened off the field, maybe the nights out and the crack and stuff, whereas obviously coming towards the mid noughties onwards, things turned a bit. Is that kind of harsh to suggest that? And if so, who was the person that changed everything that kind of, you know, improved performance and outlawed the drink, so to speak? It's not harsh, I suppose, really, because that's one of the things I was probably thinking about, we'll say... I started off, we'll say, at the, I suppose at the crest of a bit of a wave with that team that won the won the All Ireland B, and we won that. We we were Division Three champions that year. Uh, we won all seven matches we played, and uh, we were promoted. Um, but after that, then uh, I suppose a certain few of the lads in that team were getting a bit, you know, getting a bit older, and that 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 uh, team began to dwindle away. And um, I would say that my well, so, so called or supposed peak years, age wise, as a hurler would have coincided with a fair, a down, a fair old downtime in the in the fortunes of of the county team. Um, I don't know for various reasons. Uh, commitment drop levels dropped off, and as I said to you, I was I was always very committed to the county jersey and I always wore I always thought it was a proud day any day you could go out and wear the county jersey but there were days <clears throat> when we were under under pressure under severe pressure like to to hold on to our place in, in divisions like you know I know I remember one year we played Mayo again Mayo it's another game against Mayo over in um, Burr in a relegation playoff to a down it could possibly have been down to division Possibly down to Division Four, as it as it was, or or maybe the de facto Division Four, maybe Three A, or I don't know what it was called, and we only barely came out of it uh, with, a, with with a victory, like you know, um, and it was it was a great victory for us because I think if we had to go down to those levels and no disrespect the teams at that level, but I would have always felt that the hurlers were in Carlo, and I would have counted myself as good a hurler as the fella a mile away from me across the border in Kilkenny or a mile other way across the border in, in Wexford and you know having seen all the horrors that I heard with up along and saying we're as good as any of these lads and we should be hurling at a higher level but you know it's just that time to again it's a numbers thing and we didn't have we couldn't we'll say absorb one or two fellas not playing not not uh, given the commitment and we were often tin in the ground you know and um just didn't 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 have the success that we maybe the count the players in the county might have merited at the time, like you know, um, I suppose the the following year, nineteen ninety four, uh, ninety five league again started in October, and uh, I was uh, had hadn't been able to go down train, and I was again I suppose you, I I could count myself I wasn't overly committed I wasn't committed as I should have been, but I was very busy over in college at, in the first few weeks, and we played Wexford in the first round. I think, and then Dublin, and then we were playing Offaly, Offaly in Bora, and Offaly had just come off the back of the famous smash and grab All-Ireland final victory in, against Limerick that year, and I knew uh, coming down to the match I had been dropped, and um, uh, again, because sort of, I, wasn't, I wasn't around and I didn't deserve to be on the team, so, but I was on the panel, and uh, Denoli, the famous racehorse, was in his pump at the time, and there was a race meeting, meeting on in, in uh, Punches Town that day uh, that Denoli was running in and uh, one or two players who were named to start on the team that day uh, I thought they must have, they must have they, 
there's no GPS in the cars or there's no set in the cars that time but they ended up in Punchestown to see Denoli any of that day and um, Martin Fitz was in the dressing room and naming out the team and there was no sign to buy his any and he looked at me and he says right Cody you may play any you want to reserve a little poor yeah yes for, for all the training you're after doing he said but anyway, you're playing and what's more he says you're Mark and Brian Whelan <laughs> so, <laughs> so there I was and I got out in, in uh, it was in Tullamore that day Mark and Brian Whelan and uh, I suppose it's an early memory for, of the game and he got two or three points as well and after Brian Whelan was going up and down the wing with a new time I wasn't really I wasn't really trying to uh, uh, busy myself trying to mark him. I said, look, if you're going to try and mark him, you're not going to get too much change out of him. So try and keep away from him as much as you can. And actually, we gave a very good account of ourselves. I think when he got maybe five or six pints that day, uh, Brendan Hayden gave an exhibition of free taking that day. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so uh, Brendan Fenley, the late Brendan Fenley, got to go to him, who just died there last year, they came on board then and we made a bit of a burst in the Leinster Intermediate Championship. And trained under he brought in Niall Rennick uh, to train us um, and I have to say it was the first time that we ever really got some real good physical training in but again it was all all um, endurance and, and running and, and speed work like that there was, there was no no weights involved but by Jesus we were able to keep going for the hour and um, we played Wexford in the first round in, in that championship blown Belfield in Enniscorthy and the end we uh, we hammered the daylights out of him below there. I think I'm not afraid they were expecting to beat us fairly well, like, and uh, heard, we heard very well. And um, then we went down a bit mead uh, later on in that championship and played Kilkenny in the Leinster final. And uh, Kilkenny, uh, Kilkenny bet us, bet us fairly well too, we just didn't hurt on the day. Um, but uh, that was kind of then started to go downhill, downhill. Michael Walsh got a famous victory out of us. Uh, above in Navan against Mead in the Leinster Championship where again we were severe underdogs but geez, we took out a great victory and I remember thinking that was the day Big Des broke the Carroll goal scoring record like sure Des was a goal machine and it was actually a very proud day that day uh, that when we won that game because as I said no one gave us a wide and earthly hope and there was the odd little the odd little kind of a day that that um, was the exception to the rule like we were always struggling at the likes of like playing likes of Ross Common, me uh, Monaghan in at league level, like you know, and again that, that just is kind of sticking my craw. And again, no, no disrespect to all things, but I just feel that we would have hurdles in Carrow at any given at any given stage that would be able to compete at a higher level than that, like you know. So the change, I suppose, came then was near my the end of my time. I suppose when Owen Garvey took over, and Owen had been successful with with uh, underage teams in Carrow and. Uh, he bought with him uh, Paul Carty from Wexford again as 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 a trainer, but he was he was the one that started to incorporate uh, gym work, and again we were very very fit and, and everyone bought into it, and there was a newer younger player coming on the, on the scene like likes of Edward Cody and all these lads were becoming. Uh, established and well established on teams at this stage and Owen Nolan and Michael and you know they were, they, these guys were they, these, these guys had no hang ups about Carlo not being at the top table like you know they wanted to be there like you know that was the time that Chrissy Ring I suppose was was brought into play there was a, a chap from down that I used to have many uh, running with his name was Simon Wilson a great hurler tough 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 bio but he was built like a brick, you know, hot house, you know. He was as wide as he as he was long, like, you know, and and, and strong as an ox. And many the day he lined me up and, and plastered me with a with a with a shoulder. But um we were playing them um, the Christie Ring semi final that year, above in Parallel Park, in Owen's first year over us. And uh, they beat us unfortunately, but uh, I remember and I got this ball one time and Simon Wilson saw his chance. Oh, here's your man I'm going to plaster him again. So I could see him coming and got my foot planted and my shoulder out to meet him. And for the first and only time, because he was one that ended up on the ground and he was actually stretched off. And I remember he said, Jesus, why wasn't I doing this gym work 10 years ago? <laughs> like, you know, you know uh, that was, you know, that was the thing. Like, you know, I was just, wasn't any bigger or, he- or heavier than, than, uh, I was at any time in, in me in my career, but I was conditioned for it. Like we had some great results against, like there was a, a famous res- result against Offaly in the league in Carlow that year. And again, the Offaly would have been regarded as much a much higher level team at that stage than they are now, obviously. But um, 
you know, we, we, we were, we qualified for the league final that year against Offaly and they got revenge on us against in, in Port Leash in the final. But, um, you know, then I suppose the following year was my last year with Carlo and, uh, we qualified for the Chris Stringy final against Antrim, and again we were just we were just green. We were we were wet behind the ears, like we had never we had no um, experience at Croke Park, and I'd never set foot on, on Croke Park apart from in uh, when I was about nine years of age after not earning the final, and um, we weren't even allowed up to tr- to, to get our bearings in the place. You know, to, we probably might have should have agitated for a bit more of a chance to get up there. Whereas Antrim were, had been playing a few matches over the previous few years in in Crow Park and were more more attuned to the kind of day that was in it. And uh, Ashley, we were well beaten. We were well beaten. Uh, the game was over after 20 minutes. We couldn't even get on the scoreboard. Like you know, just to, the whole occasion passed us by. And I remember thinking to myself, if only I was 20 years of age with no hang ups coming into the game like you know just go out and, and, and treat the game like a, like any other old game um, I suppose like like me my county debut like you know and have six or seven points before it, as legend would have it but um, no we, I, I was I remember thinking to myself no no if I had been back when I was 20 years of age this would have been better like I wasn't happy with how I played myself and you know it was a poor old Carroll performance but um, yeah I'd say I would, When you think you were kind of that bit uptight before that given the fact that you were that bit older that's a kind of a Yeah uh, it's funny a little uh, bit strange I suppose Yeah well you see what happens uh, I was putting pressure on myself I'd, I had a feeling that my time as a Hurler County Hurler World Cup was coming to an end and it was you know, last chance saloon kind of a thing like you know and uh, uh, I don't know I, I don't know just Maybe, maybe I, I, I thought that yeah, that was maybe pressure. I put pressure on myself as one, one of the elder states around the team. And um, I remember ringing, ringing friends of mine during the week previous, like likes of um, Andrew Mitchell, a fat chap from Westmead, was a great free taker, and he had played in Crow Park a few times and asking about taking frees and in different parts of Crow Park and what's the wind like and all that and into the hill 16 end or whatever like you know I probably should have just went up and just played the game and just put, put the ball down hit, hit the feckin free and let that be that like you know I think it was over I overthought the whole thing like you know like I'd say apart from apart from um, Owen Nolan and and Edward Corey that day who both had stormers I'd say there wasn't many Carroll players I could say that could be happy with how they were how they played when they came off, came off the field like you know so my last year as a an adult hurler we'll say in 2002 or sorry 2010 what am I saying 2010 in the county final where I hadn't hurled for two years previous because of injury and, and um, you know I was 35 years of age and it was definitely going to be my last chance but I remember walking around I had my little one on my shoulder uh, I went little, she was about two or three years of age in the parade and I took off my helmet and I was looking around and I was waving and smiling at lads and saying Jesus two years ago you thought you'd never hurl again and look at her and she's so lucky to be here and whatever happens isn't this great like you know and thanks be to God you're back here out on the field hurling for your club in the county final again and sail through the game like it was sure things went well that day but like you know it was nice it's funny how your your mindset before a game and your can can affect it and that's why I would you know be always trying to emphasize the players like you know preparation is key but like don't let it be don't let the game itself be the be all and end all because if, if it becomes too much too big a thing if uh, things start going wrong you start trying to dig yourself out of a hole and you actually start digging deeper and deeper like you know so preparation is, is one thing but you don't you can't go too overboard either like you know mentally I think you know you have to you have to compartmentalise it and, and think about things outside the game as well you know that was uh, the 10th of the 10th 10. 10 so uh, 2002 yeah 10, oh, 2010 10-10-10 yes yeah yeah that's right yeah. a, mighty, a mighty day and um, a special look, day is that kind of uh, is that kind of the silver lining that came around the the injury, of course, are referred to as a finger injury, and I know you still have an issue with that mm. kind of baby finger. Yeah, um, yeah. Was that the, was that the big silver line? You thought to yourself, "Wow, well, I'm so lucky to be actually out here. Uh, this thing has kind of kept me really, really detached from the game the last couple of years, yeah. and I'm going to give this one last round and go and enjoy it." Was that pretty much it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I was like, a, I was like a young fella playing his very first game, first county final. And not being nervous, and having no, I had, I had no care in the world, uh, to be honest with you. Um, uh, I had, as you had, I'd broken my finger in uh, 
in the 2007 county semi final against uh, against uh, Nave Breed and in the throw in the start second half and um, we played the county final then the following week uh, and I was ruled out of the game in 2007 and but as you do you look up all avenues to see what you can do to see can you play the game it's a little finger on my right hand sort of my hurling hand and uh, there's a doctor down here, Dr. Helly, in uh, uh, Great Man and he, in Skok. He's very heavily involved in the Blacks and Whites GA Club. And he's a hurling, great hurling man. And uh, I got talking to him anyway and said, Jesus, is there anything you could do to have a look at his finger of mine and see if I could play this county final, you know? So I met him in his surgery and he looked at me and said, I'll tell you what, no, Pat Cody, I'll be in Bennett's Bridge next Sunday morning because Blacks and Whites are playing. Connie Shamrocks in the, the, the I think it's Northern final uh, of some ju- of the junior championship or Northern semi final in the Kenny Junior Championship. You come over uh, to Bennis Bridge. I'll meet you in the dressing room at half time, and I'll put your finger in such a way that if a horse beat it off, he wouldn't feel it. So once he once he mentioned that to me, I was over at half time on my way to the match above in Carlo and took my finger out of the splint and sure as an all the pain was something shocking. But uh, he stuck two needles in it and then shook my hand and I felt nothing. So that was it. He strapped it to me, my ring finger, and uh, on he went to the game and played the game. And unfortunately, the game didn't go that, that well for us. Uh, Monist Rangers are, were our nemesis that time. And um, unfortunately for me then as well, around 10 minutes to go, the anaesthetic started wearing off my finger and the pain was going through me every time I went near the ball. But uh, yeah, we were... Um, because of because of that injection and because uh, may I say I lay no blame at, at um, Dr. Hilly I blame lay the blame sorely at my own feet or sorely at my own feet um, I would I did a lot of damage to the finger that day and uh, did permanent damage to it and, and had to have a few operations after and I couldn't hurl I was finished as a hurler um, until about again 18 months or best part of two years later when I had another operation and it was a little bit of movement and a little bit of um, mobility in it and uh, said Mullins had that year been annihilated by Mullinster Rangers in the final section of the league champ- of the championship in, in Carlow and didn't even qualify for a semi-final which for St Mullins uh, at any time would, would be a disaster and I remember thinking to myself and looking at my hand and bending my finger a bit I said Jesus if I could get back and help a small little bit and even if we got back to a semi-final and you know, help out a small bit. So um, uh, that winter, anyway, uh, I was down at the club lotto and the club chairman was there and they were, they were sending out letters to players about, you know, panels and going back training for the following year. And I wouldn't have even been on the list at this stage. Like, I was gone for two years. And I just mentioned John Joel, I just said, uh, I heard you were sending out letters to a few about, you know, getting panels together for the full coming year and training and whatever. I said, we are. He says, yeah, sure has to be done. I suppose if start, we're, we're, we're behind a lot of clubs in the county now. And I uh, sure just said, you wouldn't mind sending one to me, John John. Sure, don't say anything on about it or whatever. And I'll have a think about it. And so that's where I started. And I started doing a bit of training on my own. And uh, I suppose that was 2010. And uh, me, uh, Paul Mam had passed away the previous year, the February 2009. And... I suppose the weighing on me, maybe I could go, if I could go back and mum's memory or whatever, like, you know, and maybe to be something, something to push on a bit. And, um, you know, that, that wouldn't have been something I would have ever mentioned to anyone, but like, it was in my own mind, you know, because again, like, sure, no more than my father, sure, they're your, your biggest supporters and uh, God, God help her, I never played a bad game in her eyes, like, you know, and many have got a bad game I played, but Jesus, if anyone ever said a word against her, Pat, Jesus, to be eruptions, <laughs> you know, so um, she would always have been, had the car parked in on the, on the bank there behind the goal, beside her, behind, beside the, um, the, the dread or beside the, the scoreboard just there up the corner because uh, she would have wouldn't have been in great health she wouldn't have to stand up or walk to the game so the boys on the on the gate would on the, they'd open the gate for her drive the car in up into the bank and that's where she always been watching the matches so um, yeah I remember when Ash look I, I sometimes I think your name is on these things like you know I don't know there was a good feeling about, in, in the club that year and the way games were going and even in the semi-final the breed had this kind of 
under uh, under the cosh and I was after being taken off and I thought I shouldn't have been taken off and I was bullying and I went a roar down at the at the boys at David died actually and just I was sitting above in the stand and I said I just let a roar Davy and he turned around and I didn't look I didn't utter a word I just glared at him and next thing about two minutes later they gave me a call back down and, and, and I was put back on and uh, managed to get on the end of a, a, a long book out that uh, geez, it was long, the longest pull out to Mark Ryan ever hit and, and got in and, and got a goal from a rebound shot that put us back in uh, in the lead and then Paddy Kyo got a free to, to kind of uh, seal the game and that got us to a semi-final or got us to a final and like I had practiced and again it goes back to putting pressure on yourself I had practiced freeze daily day, I'd say I spent an hour and a half a day that week leading up to the semi-final against Neil Breed and I couldn't, I could barely hit the ground with a free. I was so bad that day on the freeze. Like, I just couldn't understand how, how it could be so bad on him. And, like, that, that's why I was taken off them and Paddy Kyo was put on them. And I was taken off because, uh, you know, I wasn't really up to it. Desi Shaw was giving me, was making a holy show of me. And um, I could, I was imagining, as you're saying, there's Cody there now, he's bitch or no, his best, like, you know, and I said, Jesus, I was bullying. I was, I was like, I was like a dog in the sand, and that's why I roared down at Davy. I said, Jesus, I still have, I can still do something else. And uh, as it turned out, you kind of put yourself back on all Oh, sure, listen, I think Davy was, Davy turned around and he looked up at me and he, and he glared at him. He turned around again. Next thing was a nod in the heads and I was back on. But, um, I suppose it was kind of it was kind of at the time it was a kind of a, 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 a fashionable thing to do with Peter Canavan had, had started the trend at that stage with the football and putting taking on lads and taking off the old lads and putting them back on again near the end but um, uh, like I had pressure on myself before the semi-final and practiced like hell taking the freeze and missed nearly every one I took but in contrast then the fortnight later in the county final I decided, look, at this point. life's too short. And, this, you know, if whatever happens, happens. Two years ago, you never thought you'd be here. Last year, you never thought you'd be here, you know. Um, and did a bit of free taking during the week, you know. Might have might have spent half an hour, two or three nights that previous week. And, like, the freeze went for a dream for me in the county final that day. Like, you know, so... It's, so, was that day in 2010 the most enjoyable uh, moment of your hurling career, would you say, because of... The significance of the day itself and with your mom in mind? Uh, it, it was one of them, yeah, I have to say. It was, yeah. Then there was, I suppose the first one in 87 was a good one as well. Like, you know, you're, you know, as, as I was, you know, there'll only ever be one first, like, you know, against my show. Like, I, I had come onto the team, I suppose I started as a 17 year old. Uh, as a, uh, with the same one senior team and I'm sure Michael were in their pomp that time and they were beating us in semi-finals and finals and Parnells were beating us in semi-finals and, and Carlo Town were beating us in semi-finals and we couldn't like we could we were always nearly men and uh, sure then of course Neil Breed decided to be, to become a, a, a team and came along in 96 and we finally got over Michael in semi-final and Neil Breed come, comes along and beat us in the final in 96 <laughs> you know and uh then eventually we got to over the line in ninety seven, and uh, I think eventually that that was I suppose the maturing of that team, that that group of young players that I mentioned about winning under twelve and under and minor and under twenty one, that it eventually took the heartbreak of the defeat against um, against uh, Neil Breed in ninety six to say this is not going to happen again, and like of all the championships we ever won that I ever won with St. Mullins, the one in 97 was the one where we were really kind of from the word go. I think we were fully deserving of that, of that championship and we weren't going to beat him, like, you know, and Michael weren't, weren't, we beat Michael fairly well in the final. There's two other things I kind of want to address. First of all, going back to the fact that you teach in Boris and you still do, um, yeah. how strange is that kind of coaching those kids knowing that they're not going to be St. Mullins hurlers and... I know people do it up and down the country, but St. Mullins and Monaster Renders literally right beside each other. So you're almost kind of um, fine tuning the future of the rival club, so to speak. I tell you the truth, uh, Kevin, from the word go, it is never an issue, really. Um, like, yeah, yeah, would separate your, separate your, um, I suppose, professional and, and, and sporty or personal life. Uh, to relate to that 
extent. Like, you know, um, at the end of the day, when you look up at little fellas and little girls with hurls in their hand, all you want to do is do your best for them and, you know, help them along their, their way. Um, although I do remember one day above in, in Bagnestown, Parry Nolan from Munster Rangers bury me up against the wall with a shot and think to myself, Jesus, it wasn't too long ago and I was showing you how to hold the hurl right. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, that, that, that's great, great thanks for you, like, you know, but I, I wasn't even saying that, I was saying that just, I kind of half laughing at him, like, saying it to him, like, you know, but um, no, 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 there's just some, no, it's, 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 look at us, as Munster Rangers' great success is, is, is a testament more to the work that they've done in, their, in the club and, 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 and the great work, the great players that they've had coming through, and and they've, in a very short period of time, built their own tradition. Like you know, we have a tradition going back in St. Mullins back, back to the twenties and thirties. But like Monaster Rangers, were already formed in the in the nineties. But like I really look at what they've established themselves as, like you know, and it's a great credit credit to the club. Yeah, because they set a precedent in becoming the first Carlow club to ever reach a senior Leinster club final, and then St. Mullins repeated that feat only in the past year. So how proud were you? on Leinster final day, St. Mullins versus Ballyhill Shamrocks and how incredible was that run? Well, sure, I suppose it is the most exciting thing ever happened to this parish. I can't think of it. We had a bishop our day and St. Mullins men our day the bishop 30, 35 years ago but I don't think that that uh, stirred, the, stirred the blood as much as, as the last, uh, I suppose, last eight or nine months have. Yeah, it was, look, as anyone who knows me, if I'm not involved in a team and when it's my own uh, club and my own, I become as big a fanatic. I go, I go, I, I, I go mental on the sideline. I, I love it. It's, it's the heart rate to be going at ninety, and I suppose the the drama of of St. Mullins' year this year was definitely unprecedented in our history. And I will say that it began at the semi final where Berlin Killen had his dead and buried and. Uh, a very lucky goal with the last puck of the game got us a draw and got us into extra time and it is like as if something happened in the mindset of the players like they performed very well in extra time and what team won the game be six or five or six points in the end and then the county final going down to 40 men after about 10 minutes and, and getting the dramatic last minute winner like you know when we were kind of ahead and the whole time along like you know and, and uh Sure, it's well documented about the uh, goings on at the Cooley game, you know, um, with uh, Michal Ryan having his his heart his heart scare and like you know that that, that again I, I think that kind of brought things into perspective again, like you know how much and, and the family would be at pains to I, I, Helen and Michal and and and, and Michal's family would be at pains to point out like how much the club helped and 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 the support of of the club and and, and if ever. There was goodwill and people pulling for somebody that day. It was the same ones people on the bank uh, and in the grounds, and and just it was the fear of what was unfolding in front of us was just unbelievable. Like you know, because like you know, you're looking at one of your best friends, and so basically he was gone. He was dead on the ground in front of us, you know, and the the amazing work that was done uh, by the Order of Malta and and the ambulance crew and that that doctor from Kula that happened to be in the stand and and you know there's four, there was four different people taking turns doing CPR on Michal that day and after forty minutes they brought him back and Michal is back laying blocks the very same as if nothing ever happened to him like you know it was it was an amazing thing an amazing thing and I, I kind of caught the imagination of the county and and the wider hurling public as well like you know um you know that, that became part of the folklore of the year and then we were it was the game against uh, Rat Downey, which was on telly, which was again uh, unprecedented for St. Mullins. And um, I remember I was actually away in Belfast that weekend uh, with a few friends of mine, and one of them was um, Brian O'Mara from Mullinahone at Hurl of Tipperary. And uh, I was leaving early Sunday morning to come down to the game, and uh, Brian had uh, gotten an, uh, a lift up with me, and he, but he was going to come down with some other friends. Where he said, Jesus, so he was. He woke up in fairly good old fettle. He wasn't as bad as he expected to be. So um, uh, he got into the car and he drove down with me. And I can bring to be a shrewd hurling man, like you know, he's a, he he he's be a, he knows what he's talking about, like you know. And of course, I was being the nervous supporter. I said, "Yes, I don't know. I think this one might be a bit too far for us." And I was thinking to, to name some of the Rat Downey team, you know, Ross King and Paddy Purcell and all these fellas and. Not thinking of our own men like Seamus Murphy and Mouse and James Cap- James Doyle, like they were probably thinking the same thing with Horlands. But um, 
So we're at came down to watch to the game anyway, and I was saying, I remember saying to Brian, look at it, yes, the television cameras are here now. I hope to God. I said, even for both clubs' sake, that the game is good and that they won't be saying, oh, Jesus, look what you had on television. It wasn't a disaster of a game. And sure, how could it be any good? And then a team from Carroll and a team from Leach, like, you know. And sure, as it turned out, sure, the game was a cracker and it was the best game of the year so far, like, you know. Again, sure, the, the drama of the, of the thing with James Doyle scoring the last two points and, and getting us over the line. And sure, it was dreamland then at that stage. And, you know, then going on to face the mighty belly hail and, and, uh, I remember a neighbour of mine down the road, he wrote a little poem about, you know, about the, about the boys. And I remember reading it inside, uh, in a preview inside with um, with Brendan in the studios. And halfway down through the poem, and I, I could start seeing all these faces across in front of me. I could see my father's face and I could see uh, Michal Ryan's father, who was uh, fairly aged and he couldn't, he wouldn't have been at the match. He wouldn't have to go to these matches. I could see, I, could, I was thinking of all the people that went before us, like, you know, and uh, that had us where we were, like, because, you know, yourself, we're only ever, we're, we're only as good as the people that, that went before us and we're standing on the shoulders of giants, like, you know, oh, jeez, I, I was nearly influenced by the end of the, by the, end of the poem. I had to stop reading for a few seconds and compose myself and go on again, like, you know, and that's like, that's how much it meant, like, to, to for us and that's how much... I suppose the hurling means uh, to to people down in St. Wallens and just just a great occasion, like you know, um, and obviously it didn't go well for us. Didn't the result didn't go for us on the day, but like we 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 put it up to Bally Hill for a long time in the game, and there was a just a to the thirty seconds either side or at the at the end at the beginning of the second half, where James Dial shaved shaved the ball off the post. I would have brought a four point deficit down to one point and from the result of the book out then TJ wins it and passes it into Colin Fennelly and he walks into the net and what was possibly one point behind within 30 seconds was seven points and then we were we were we were fighting losing battle from then on but like we fought manfully till the end like you know and I remember thinking to myself with a few minutes to go now is the time and even though the game was up how proud we were of the, the boys and, and the, the year they given us and I started uh, singing the Saints go marching in, like, you know, just to make sure that the players could hear us and that we, that they still meant a lot to us, like, you know, and we're proud of them, like, you know, so I think that's one thing about the G in Hurland that, that um, I suppose, no more than any other thing as you'll be talking to um, on this podcast series, like, it, it, it's, it gets down to the very base of, base of your heart and, and, and it's a, uh, it's it's a, it's almost a primal thing in if you if you've grown up with it, uh, and uh, it's part of your tradition and it's part of your family. The second thing I wanted to address uh, when I said uh, I had two things to address. Yeah, you hold the distinction of being the first hurler to score a sideline court and be awarded two points for it. Am I right in saying that back in two thousand five? I think it, I think that's true. Yeah, it was very early in the first round of the league, and uh, all the all the games started at the same time. And I think maybe after five minutes or something, I got a sideline ball and clipped it over the bar. It's funny, actually. Uh, we got to the final that year against Kerry uh, over in Turles. I think it was a great Galway or a great football uh, f- match as well. Uh, Kerry and Dublin, so Turles was packed by it and we played our match. Um, but I scored one that day as well. So And then the, the thing was canned. So I suppose that was a league final I think I could, I think I scored the last one as well so scored the first one and the last one I think I don't know I think again maybe if Leo Leo would be the man to, to trawl through the records for that one but I think I think that's that's true yeah I think it, might, it may be true yeah Absolutely Leo McGough um, I was lucky enough to have him as coach when we were under 14 county back in 2005 man. and he's possibly with us in 2006 as well and just an incredible historian he used to love reading his reports as well in the Nash has grown up on Absolutely uh, yeah. of people. and, and uh, uh, like just again man would fill with passion and, and grow for the game and you know coming out of every pore of his, of his body like you know so it's, men like, it's men like Leo that make the GA like you know Big time. So, Pat, nitty gritty stuff. What's your uh, best fifteen that you've heard of? It? Oh, I've heard of it. Yeah. Um, I suppose, like I was, like we were saying there on this team. But the team, the way I picked the team was, I picked the players who were at the peak of their, who were at their best when I heard of them. If you know what I mean. Like we'll say, right. for example, Paddy Kyo of St. Mullins and Ireland, or Seamus Murphy of St. Mullins and Ireland, two of, I suppose, the most influential hurlers in St. Mullins for the last, and in Carlow for the last, I suppose, 10 years. 
even though party has gone, it's good for years, but like party was on a three in a row team and was a linchpin of that team, like, you know, but I, party was on the team that I played with in 2010, but he was only starting off his career and he's playing corner forward where he's, he really made his name as a centre back and a half back. Um, Seamus Murphy was influential in 2010, but again, he was at the beginning of his career and, you know, would have, it was very influential in every every uh, St. Mullins uh, success over the last 10 years, like, you know. So I picked it uh, on those lines that the goalkeeper would be uh, Richie Keelty, was on the county team that won that famous uh, All Ireland B final in ninety two, and then was on the ninety seven team and on the, the early teams that I won uh, championships with in St Mullins. Like Richie would be the first fella himself to say he wasn't the most. He wouldn't have been the greatest trainer, I suppose, or, or he, he he might miss the odd one, but um, he was the best I ever saw to uh, prevent a goal in a one on one situation. He just had his knack of coming out and smothering the forward and getting his hurl to the, to the strike and blocking the ball. And he had, he had a great eye um, for that kind of a shot. And for a kind of a small enough in stature, he's very good under eye, dropping ball, good hand. But I think where he really excelled was at his puckouts. Nowadays, puckout strategy is a big thing in the game. And uh, short puckouts and long puckouts. But Richie was doing that 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago. Like Richie would hit a puckout. Uh, which would might go above twenty feet in the air uh, into a half hour hand or or on, in, onto a man running across a half hour line. He was lethal, and like a, I would have been the benefit of a lot of those um, down through the years, uh, both playing as a centre fielder and a half hour, like you know. So um, the other fellow I actually have mentioned in that is uh, Graham Clark of Down. Um, now I'm putting Graham Clark down because. He's the only one I've mentioned. I put I, the story position. I put down two players was because I thought that uh, Graham Clark was. You can't play with sixteen pack. I know that, yeah. I know that, yeah. Well, sure, I, <laughs> but just, I think I think the likes of these fellas from our counties, like down these lads, deserve to be mentioned because he wouldn't be a household name. But Graham Clark was easily one of the best goalies in the country for the go to ten years. Um, but I played with him on the Shinty team, the Shinty team over in Scotland. And he was just unbelievable. He was a real athlete. He couldn't like, and he would know again, like Richie, he would put a puck out on on a sixpence anywhere on the field. Just a super, super, super player and a great fella. And like, he would, he would, I remember speaking to him in Scotland and saying that they got, he got Sean O, uh, uh, not uh, don't know he was like up to car up to do some coaching like you know up and down for goalkeepers and I remember thinking, I, said, I said to him I said Graham I said to you it's don't know he was like, should be asking you down to car to, 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 he, he, he's not half the goal I remember saying to him he's not half the goalkeeper you are you know the full back line is Eugene McDonald cornerback Tom Dyle full back and Andrew Gall uh, left cornerback I tinkered around with this um uh, for a while, uh, but there was one dead cert anyway, and that was Andrew Gall. Um, uh, for about a period, I'd say about four or five years, Andrew Gall was, was and I have no point, I, I like people say, ah, oh, you're cracked, but I, there was no better cornerback or for that matter, harder in Ireland for a while than Andrew Gall. Andrew Gall was unbelievable. And I just pity, I, I felt so sorry for many players coming out on him and say they would have had him in stature, strength, whatever, but they could, and, and come out and say, oh, geez, look at your man, I'm going to tear this fella asunder, you know? And he cleaned so many fellas out of it, bigger, smaller, no one could hurt him. Uh, and he was a, such a lovely striker the ball, like, and he played centre field, he played centre forward with his club. But I think there for a few years when he was playing there in half back or maybe wing back or corner back, he was just on, no one could hurt him. On the other corner, Eugene, Welcher, well, a great friend of mine and a great sparring partner, and he was a great leader for St. Mullins. Uh, he, when Eugene spoke, everyone listened, like, you know, and, and he was a typical little contrary little redhead, and he hated, he just hated getting getting beaten, hated. And, like, he was for five foot, I don't know, four, five foot five, five foot six, and he's a small fella, but he was he would always hurl with 37 inch hurl. Again, a throwback to the bygone days, and, uh, like, he was love seeing Des Murphy coming on top of him to mark him. You know, he would he would be playing full back at the start of his career with Sam Mullins and like, geez, he'd, he'd love seeing Des. And both 
I suppose both Eugene and Andrew Gall, like they'd be, I suppose, the furthest part of the field away from me and generally where I'd be playing in the half hour lane or centre field. But there were always players that used to come and you did lift a team. There's not not nothing kind of I don't think anything, anything lifts a team as much as a small player winning the ball and driving the ball on the field. It's a bit like that's how the likes of Willie O'Connor always had the crowd going and Tommy Walsh always seemed to get had a great rapport with the crowd because he was always seen as a little bit smaller and coming up against bigger men and coming out under of a forest of hurdles under a high ball and catching the ball. And that's what the boys used to be able to do. Eugene and, and Andrew Gall would rally a team just not by anything they'd say on the pitch but just by directions and you'd, you'd say I remember often, I remember often thinking in when the fat was in the fire in the county final or a, a tough championship match or with Carroll or a league match and seeing Eugene or, or, or Andrew coming out with the ball and, and, and just blazing and, and, and cleaning out a fella six foot three and, and coming out under his arm or something and out through Dave and Needle and giving away a pass or clearing the ball down the field and saying, Jesus, the, the by Jesus, that ball comes near me, I can't let him down. Like, you know, he's, you couldn't, you couldn't let, let those fat legs of those down that could give you such leadership like that, like, you know. And then uh, Tom was fullback. Um, so Tom from, was made the fullback as a spot his own there for years with Sam Hollins and with, with, uh, with the county and I suppose he was I suppose if the boys were two little small fellas Tom was different Tom was all commanding both in the air and on the ground and, and always very sure and calm and uh, you know just if you knew Tom was behind you you know we were in, in fairly in fairly good nick and, and uh, just just uh, a great 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 again not a great leader but quiet man on the field but just again led by example like you know so uh, go on to the half back line then and um uh, Eddie Cody's number five and sure I suppose Eddie's number one lads you'd have to put down first of all straight away too like for his longevity with, with Carlo he started off in his time when when, uh, when times were maybe lean with the county and I, again I suppose another fellow who would be quite deceptive and would seem to be slight and bill but like you'd know when you hit Eddie or you'd know if Eddie hit you um he, he you'd be the one he would one that wouldn't be going back uh, and uh, again just a born leader and a super intelligent hurler and worked worked non-stop on his game what I liked about him as a hurler I suppose as as maybe someone that you'd want on your side is that he believed he was a good hurler that's what you need he believed that he was as good as anybody else whereas maybe when he's wearing a black and red jersey he'd be saying this that that, that that fella's a cocky whore and who does he think he is like you know um, I remember it I remember in in the in the 2010 final actually uh, I, I was Mark Richard Eddie's brother so another great hurler but um, uh, uh, there was a bit of flare up about 10 or 15 minutes from the end and someone gave Sean Gann a bit of a done to give a, give a bit of a, a rap of a hurl and I went to go for him I said Jesse you can't stand back from this like you know but Eddie saw me making me move for the other fella and he went to go intercept me but I saw Eddie coming for me and I I got myself turned and faced Eddie and be the Lord Jesse he gave me such a belt I swear to God I'll never forget he shook every bone in my body and I think I remember he said don't get in when I, I took me about three minutes before I could catch me breath before but uh, you know and like anyone that would see Eddie tugged out would say Jesus for that that'd be blown over like a feather but no he's a hard man and a super super hurler you know for number six I think you could pick it yourself um, towards Johnny Nevin look at it speaks for itself like you know um, one of the all time greats in both codes in any county anywhere in the country yeah you know he's no, he's known all over the country like you know uh, the bigger the game the better Johnny will play I, a bit like Brian Whelan I suppose that way he like I'd love to know I'd say more than likely I think he was man of the match at the time he won the All-Ireland B he was man of the match the year he won maybe he won their first county final he could possibly be man of the match the year he beat one of the Rangers with the last minute goal. Right. Uh, like, I think if you look back at Brian Whelan's career he won many man of the matches in All-Ireland finals Leinster finals and All-Ireland club finals Johnny was of the same cut from the same thought like he just produced it on the big day knew how to prepare knew how to like mentally very strong and then obviously had the skill to back it up like you know so again I suppose it's kind of it's a bit of a pattern on my team so far <laughs> uh, 
Tom Dyle is the only man and Eddie I suppose is tall enough but they're all all these fellas are small enough in stature but like you know Johnny has, has it everywhere like you know and the thing about it is I would even say with Eddie Cody and Giant Evan they, they, those fellas if you put them out in the horn field this minute they still think they can do it and who's to say they couldn't like you know but you know they're still in their head they're born winners like you know uh, James English David English's father is number 7 I'm sure he, he was um Jason, another smart little fella, but like he was just, oh, he was a bit like Andrew Gall in that way. He just could not be bet. He had a brilliant hand for a small man and he'd go through you for a short cut. And again, a competitive, competitive to his fingernails and a great teammate, like, you know, and I wouldn't have known James that well, like, because I was only very, very young. As I said, he was coming near enough to the end of his career when I started off with Carlo. But Jizzy was some harder. I, I always looked up to him, like, you know, and said, Jizzy, the way he's able to, able to overcome obstacles like that, he shouldn't have been able to overcome by just, you know, you, know, you think he wouldn't be able for it, like, you know, but it was just a, a great, great bit of stuff. So, Declan Kavanagh is my first midfielder, one of my great friends living down in Australia now. He was one of my, my sparring partners. Oh, actually, I tell you, I just go back to Johnny Nevin there, and it's just a little story about Johnny. Uh, about about the ninety six final that he won, you know, um, Johnny was coming out with another ball again uh, uh, in the first half of the game. Remember well, and uh, I went to go do him and I gave him a shot, and Pat Hearn was refereeing it. So I gave him a bit of a shot, and I might, I might have been a bit late, I don't know, but um, anyway, Johnny, as he was entitled to, went to go give me a shot back, like you know, and. <laughs> I said to him, God, Nevin says I, better men than you have tried and failed. And I remember thinking to myself, as I was saying it, that's a queer stupid thing you're just after saying it. <laughs> because, because it was a pure, it is a pure lie, like I said. So I said, when have you ever come across a better man than John Nevin on a horn of healing? Or, you know, and I, I, was, I was saying, Jay, you're after making some gobs out of yourself, you know, say to myself, you know, because it was a stupid thing to say, like, you know. Yeah, that was, that was just a little anecdote there about Johnny. But, um, uh, back to Declan, Declan's number eight. Um, yeah, sure, Declan was a super midfielder. Like he, he, he would have um, been a great centre back as well. But Declan was one of these fellas that just was <clears throat> assistant from the start of the game to the end and would always chip in with a few scores and great hand under a high ball. When I suppose it was a midfielder's job to, was often a mid- midfielder's job to be a, the primary fielder on a team, like you know. Um, and was a great reader of the game and, and and I suppose at a time when the game was beginning to evolve into more so than lamping the ball down the field, you would have to be astute in how you use possession and uh, Dicklin was uh, was one of the first as I'd say around you know and Sam Mullins that would just be the man to give I suppose a good ball into the forwards like you know and, and great man for link up play. The next player was um, number nine, uh, Darren McCormack from from uh, Westmead. I actually had Darren initially uh, down as a full back, and that was one of the final tinkers and tinkerings I made uh, on the team. Um, and the reason Darren was able to be on the team is because he was on that team that was uh, over in, in Inverness playing the shinty that time as well. Uh, but the unfortunate thing for me and Darren McCormack is that most of my experience was uh, against him uh, when he was playing for Westmead and no more than Andrew Gall uh, make, uh, being as good as anyone in the country at, at over a period of time Darren McCormick would have was in the same boat he's the uh, only one that's a dead cert on the team outside of Carlo. I'm just sticking in Graham Clark as a, as a, a second half goalkeeper for, for, for from, from down and then uh, Mark Mullins is um, from Aaron's own uh, is number 10 uh, he came on to the team for a year I suppose like uh, I suppose it was that, that year that we played that intermediate uh, championship under Brendan Fennelly Sir Mark Mullins was again known over the country like he had, he had slightly unorthodox uh, method of hurling because he used to turn the toe to hurl inwards as he went to go raise the ball but Jeez, he was very, very skillful for hurler. Unbelievable striker off his left hand side. Like he's just kind of looked like he was just flicking his wrists and the ball would just go jump off the hurl, to fly off the hurl over the bar from all sorts of angles. And then he was a, a big, strong, physical specimen of a player, like you know, and, and just very, very hard to handle. Like and that was the only real year I heard of him because he was he was actually based in Cork at that stage and he had had already uh, left Carlo and Captain Cork the Cork senior team and uh, Brendan Fenley had got gotten back onto the onto the um, 
onto the scene like he was down in the Piercy club down in Cork and Sean Ogo Helpin or yeah Sean Ogo Helpin's club and John Gardner's club and uh, they, he got back up and he really was a great asset to that team and, and I have to say I learned a good lot from the rest of the team is Nave Owen, Michael Heavy, uh, starting off with uh, Robbie Foley, centre forward. Myself and Robbie would have uh, been on, we were both centre field on that under 21 team that we talked about at the beginning of our conversation, uh, Kevin. Um, Robbie was, uh, he's a few years younger than I am, and he was only a uh, whippersnapper, he was only 18 on that team, I think, barely gone 19 maybe. Uh, but like, at that stage, he was so he was very physically developed. And Robbie was as strong as an ox. Uh, had great pace and again real a real competitor you know he was captain of that team that got to the Christie Ring final in my last year with Carlo great uh, centre forward like, and I suppose I would have been maybe known as a centre forward myself with the club and, and maybe with the county but I think I wouldn't have had the same strength as Robbie and that's why let's say if I would, the fact that I'm picking myself on the team I have to pick myself on the team I didn't pick myself centre forward because I didn't feel like I'd be as I had the same physical strength as, as Robbie, and Robbie was able, was a man that could bring take a take a lot of punishment and, and win a lot of primary position and 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 bring the players around. Bring this, I say, more noted scores. Although Robbie was my little score himself, but might be able to bring more more noted scores into the game. We were stuck for a wing forward, then so I stuck myself there, wing forward number twelve, uh, and uh, I'd have to have a row with Mark Mullins or who'd be taking the freeze. Right corner forward then is the man who was sending me a message from Boston as we were speaking there when I first mentioned his name is uh, John Bourne Michael. He broke Sam Mullins' hearts in so many county finals. He just had a knack of scoring big scores in big games you know and a gentleman off the field then as well and a great man to have a few points and have the crack with and I'd still be in touch with him over in in in, uh, in, in Boston there and he was home around the time of the actually the uh, the cool match there this year uh, and uh you know, unfortunate circumstances for himself that he, he lost his he lost uh, his sister, but he was in the hospital uh, and visited me all rain every day in Kilkenny Hospital at the time uh, to see how he was. And uh, you know, that's the kind of fellow John is. John uh, remembers all the old days and 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 the good old times that we had and the good old battles that we had as as players. And I tell you. I'm going to diverse a bit now. Diverge a bit. Uh, there's another player I'd like to mention too. Who was a, a great, became a great friend of mine. Was an arch hated enemy of mine. Was uh, the late Padder Jordan from Michael. And uh, Padder was a larger than life character and a, a great hurler for his club and a great Michael man. In the final in 1997, or it could have been 99. I'm not sure. Maybe 99. I'm not sure. We 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 beat Michael in, in all my finals until my last one. And I remember turning around and the, the, we, we were in the Dalman Hotel after the match for the, that time you had the pre -match or the post-match meals for the teams. And uh, I was at the bar and next thing I realised the fellow behind me was Patter. I had done it my hands and the, the knuckles were cut off both hands and the, the stinging and the pain of him was something shocking. And I remember turning around and said, Jesus, Patter, look at that. He says, why, why are you such an absolute animal on the hurling field I said to him he said look at young Cody he said if you think I'm going to let you come in here and tear in past me with a ball and bury it in the back of the day whenever you feel like it you have another thing coming I am going to do whatever I have to do to stop you and if that means that pulling on you I'll pull on you and we had a pint together we had a pint together and I said well Paddy says I said to him if that's the case you can't be surprised if I turn around and wear back off of you again or if I get past you and bog it in the back of the net that you won't come out and start sneering you or something like that he says well he says sure that's between the white lines he said and we had two or three points and we said to ourselves whatever happens on the field happens on the field and we leave it on the field after that and we were always great friends after that like and then Padder was taken from us too early like you know and remember you know these things it, 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 you share these things and then like said Padder has gone all too young from us like you know so it's uh, just a, a little aside to things you know that that, that uh, Harlan is all about the great players either and the big names and, 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 and things like that they're, they're about rivalries and friendships and, and memories like you know but um, 
that was John anyway back to back to the team and on the edge of the square is an, I know Rainer as far as I'm concerned is Big Dez I'm sure another another art enemy of ours an art enemy of mine until I got to know the man and uh, so look at the other hand that was unbelievable, unbelievable he couldn't stop him catching the ball no matter what you did all he ever wanted was goal 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 he was just a goal scoring machine I always remember one of me fondest memories as a, as a supporter was after a time the boys won the Christie ring above in Monangar against Westmead they had to have a playoff against Leash the following Sunday to get into the Leicester Championship proper and Des was a saw but he wasn't starting for Carroll at the time and Leash were sure boys were in the beard all week and Des came on for the last 10 minutes and all he wanted him to do was get a ball and, and stick it in the net like you know and the game was nearly over anyway and, and uh, Damien Roberts and Michael again came tearing over and won a ball over on the sideline in front of the bank where we'd always be standing and I remember letting a roar and dead into the big lad will ya you know and be Jesse loved in this big high ball and Des got came out and came out through a, fl- a forest of hurdles and grabbed the ball and turned and again like and he was he was 21 or 22 yards out to the side away from the goal and there was surely four backs behind him along with the goalkeeper and I knew Jez is all he wanted to do was score a goal and he turned left and he turned right and he shimmied and he burst past one of them and next he turned back on his left and he hit this kind of a a daisy cutter of the shot and I was right in line with it and it went straight like a die over to the far corner of the net and the goalie was stuck to the ground and I geez, for it for it to 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 be watching it and Carlo getting bit, I was never as happy going on the field after a game because I knew Des was finished as a, as a Carlo hurler and I just I was standing over it. I, 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 I was delighted for him, I was thrilled for him because it was his, his last act in a Carlo jersey and to see him raising the green flag for, for Carlo when he was the all time leading scorer and, and he lived for it, like you know. So it was a nice little I'd say for that game it'll be nice it'll be a nice little way for him, it was a fitting way for him to finish his career, like you know. So that's 14, and that's uh, only one more player to hold. That's uh, Davy, Davy Doyle, another great friend of mine from St. Mullins. And um, I suppose my full far line is, is a trio of born goal scorers and, and players for the big occasion. And, and uh, Davy was definitely one of those for us over the years. Like He was one that we would always turn to if we needed a goal to dig us out of a, of a, of a, of a bad situation in the game. Like He had... So it's lethal speed again hated losing I suppose uh, again it took me a while to get on to, to wave into with Davy. he was a few years older than I was and, and one of the years it was to then a semi-final or final against Michel or I can't remember how it was and I was only after coming to the team I think it was only 17 at the time or maybe 18 but um, no it was the first year I was 17 and Davy wouldn't give me a, a, wouldn't pass me a ball to save his life oh Jesus was terrible so eventually got to the stage and in one of the last matches of the league section I had to say to him Jez David what's wrong with me did you want to pass me the second ball what in the name of Jez is wrong with you so I had a little bit of an argument then anyway and uh, in the semi-final of the championship it was in Bagelstown and I think it was I think it was against Parnells actually and uh, Davy came in with the ball and he was knocked down to the ground and he was on his knees and he had the last resort and he came across uh, and roared for the ball and looked up at me and said oh Jesus I have to give this that and he gave me a grand hit hand pass anyway he says you better f- and score he says you better score that he says you know and I scored it and I said I remember I said, of course yeah no I scored you give me a warm I'll score warm I said to him like you know like a little brazen young man but now we became great friends and, and our great friends now to this day like you know and he was a Asher is a great hurler, great hurler and a great club man as well since and has been in the backroom team of, of, of St. Wallen's teams that have been successful over the last decade, like, you know, as a selector and a shrewd hurling man and a, a, a good man uh, to have in your corner at any stage. Some fantastic stories there from Pat Cody. My thanks to Pat for coming on. That's it for today's edition of the Left Wing Back Podcast. Many thanks to today's sponsor, O'Dwyer PVC Glazing Limited, known as the man who does the windows for all your replacing windows, doors and broken double glaze units. Don't forget to subscribe on your chosen podcast platform for free and check us out on social media. Until next time, take care.